Hello, we are on chapter nine in materials kinetics, which is diffusion in polycrystalline materials. Uh, if you recall last time in chapter eight, we were dealing with diffusion in single crystals. Uh, we started with the perfect crystal and then we introduced point defects and we gave some examples from both metallic single crystals as well as ionic single crystals. Um, so today in chapter nine, we are going to extend this into polycrystalline materials. Uh, what we're going to cover is first the different types of defects that occur in polycrystalline materials. Um, then we're going to cover the diffusion spectrum in imperfect crystals. Uh, this allows for fast grain boundary uh, diffusion, fast diffusion along other crystal imperfections such as dislocations. Um, and we're going to cover each of those uh, individually. So let's get started here. Um, the way I think about defects in polycrystalline materials is in terms of their dimensionality. So if we start off with a perfect single crystal, then there are no defects. And the most basic types of defects that can occur in these single crystals are um, point defects, which would be zero dimensional defects. Uh, these point defects include vacancies, which would be the absence of an atom at a particular lattice site, interstitials, where a, an extra atom is stuffed in the in-between places in between the lattice sites, and substitutions, where you've got uh, one type of atom that substitutes for the regular type of atom on the lattice. These are all zero-dimensional defects because they uh, are all occurring at points. Now, if we increase the dimensionality by one, uh, the next type of defect would be a one-dimensional defect or a line defect. And within a crystal, this is known as a dislocation. And there are a couple of types of dislocations, which we're going to cover today, including um, you know, what they are and how they impact diffusion. Uh, from there, if we increase the dimensionality again, we have two-dimensional or planar defects. These include grain boundaries, so the surfaces in between adjacent grains, as well as free surfaces. So this would be the outer surface of the material or the surface uh, around some porosity within the material. And then finally, we have three-dimensional or volume defects, uh, such as por the porosity itself. Um, and one of the common themes that we will see here in this lecture is that higher dimensional defects are typically more effective at increasing the rate of diffusion compared to lower dimensional defects. So already zero dimensional or point defects, as we saw last time, increase the rate of diffusion compared to just having a perfect crystal. Uh, it's even more effective if you have dislocations because these linear defects of dislocations is like a whole line worth of defects. And then uh, grain boundaries or free surfaces would be entire planes worth of defects. So diffusion along crystal imperfections. Diffusion rates can be orders of magnitude faster along crystal imperfections compared to crystals containing only point defects. And this is something that's true not only of diffusion, but kinetic properties in general, is that when they vary, they often vary by orders of magnitude. So it's, it's not a subtle change here. It's uh, drastic differences in the diffusion coefficient as a result of having these defects. And these line and planar defects uh, can provide what we call short circuit diffusion pathways um, or pathways along which the diffusion is significantly faster compared to going through that of a perfect crystal. And some of these short circuit uh, diffusion pathways include uh, the core of the dislocation, um, internal interfaces such as grain boundaries, as well as free surfaces. Um, this shows a, a typical plot to explain by what I mean by short circuit diffusion pathways. This is a typical Arrhenius plot for various diffusion pathways and an example of uh, face centered cubic metal, uh, where this plot, which is meant to be uh, kind of qualitative to show you the different trends that are common, this shows the log of diffusivity versus the inverse temperature. This is the reduced temperature or the melting point over the temperature. So one on this plot corresponds to the melting point, 
and anything that's less than one would correspond to the liquid state. This DL here would be the diffusivity in the liquid, which of course is very fast because things are flowing in the liquid. Now to the right of this dashed line, this is where we are in the solid state. And you can see that there are many different lines here indicating diffusivity following various mechanisms where this lowest diffusivity, the slowest diffusion is DXL. This is diffusion in a bulk crystal free of line or planar defects. So in other words, this would just have the point defects, the zero dimensional defects such as vacancies or interstitials. And this has the lowest diffusivity. Now, if we increase the dimensionality of the defects from zero to one, then we have this DD line, which is dislocation as, a re or, sorry, it's diffusion along a dislocation core. So the diffusivity increases uh, often by orders of magnitude, just as the result of having dislocations in the material. Then if we increase this to two-dimensional defects uh, along a grain boundary here, you get even faster diffusivity. This is this D with a superscript B. And um, even faster would be diffusion along a free surface. This can be either an outer surface of the material or an internal surface around a pore, um, where really there's almost no barrier for di for diffusion compared to the other cases because you just have atoms that are loosely bonded to the surface of the material and therefore they have the least resistance to, um, to diffusion. So this is the so-called uh, spectrum of diffusivities that show uh, how you can get this accelerated diffusion because of these short circuit diffusion pathways um, owing to these high, higher order uh, defects that occur in polycrystalline materials. Uh, here's an actual example. This is based on Atkinson's um, book here, Diffusion in Ceramics, uh, where this shows the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient versus inverse temperature. This is for a nickel oxide system. And you can see the short circuit diffusion pathways that exist along both dislocations and grain boundaries. Um, so here, this shows the uh, diffusivity um, along the grain boundaries of oxygen. Uh, this over here would be the dislocation along grain boundaries of nickel. Now, if we compare that to dislocation, or diffusion along dislocations of nickel, you can see that with the grain boundaries, this is um, almost two orders of magnitude faster along the grain boundaries compared to the dislocations. It's the same type of thing if you compare the diffusivity of oxygen along grain boundaries compared to dislocations. There's orders of magnitude of difference. And if we compare those diffusivity values within the single crystals, here you see uh, diffusion within a single crystal for nickel, which is orders of magnitude lower than the diffusivity um, along the dislocation cores or along the grain boundaries. Same thing for oxygen. Um, so you can see that there's in this case, seven to eight orders of magnitude faster diffusion um, because of grain boundaries, um, you know, about five or six orders of magnitude faster along dislocation cores uh, compared to the bulk crystal diffusion. So what is uh, one of the simple ways that we can um, assess diffusivity in a polycrystalline material? let us consider the simple case where the grain boundaries are stationary. So the grain boundaries themselves are considered to be not moving at this point. And each uh, diffusing atom is able to diffuse both inside the grains itself, so within the crystals themselves, and along several of the different grain boundaries. This occurs whenever the diffusion distance in the grains during the diffusion time t is significantly larger than the grain size. And one simple model for this to get the combined diffusivity is shown here, where this uh, diffusion coefficient d is uh, a sum of or a weighted average of the diffusivity within the crystal itself, dxl, times the fraction of atomic sites that are inside the crystal, so not at one of the boundaries of the crystal, that's one minus eta, plus the diffusion at the grain boundaries, D superscript B, 
times the fraction of atomic sites that exist at the grain boundary. So this is just a simple weighted average of taking the diffusivity of atoms at the grain boundaries times the fraction of atoms that exist at those grain boundaries, plus the diffusivity within the crystal times the fraction of atoms that are existing inside the crystal itself. Um, this shows you some example data based on Turnbull's work uh, for diffusion in single crystal versus polycrystalline silver. And what you can see here is we've got the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient versus inverse temperature. And in single crystal silver, the diffusivity is shown by these red squares. And in the polycrystalline version of the same material, so exactly the same silver, just making it polycrystalline instead of single crystal, the diffusion is um, you know, in about an order of magnitude faster. It depends on where you are with respect to temperature. But you can see immediately here the impact of having grain boundaries is providing those fast diffusion pathways such that the diffusion in the polycrystalline material, which has those grain boundaries, is significantly faster compared to diffusion in the single crystal. Uh, this is in the so-called multiple boundary diffusion regime, since the diffusion field overlaps multiple grain boundaries. Or in other words, we're monitoring the diffusion on a time scale that is long enough for the diffusing atoms to pass through um, multiple grain boundaries. Now, one of the simplest and most commonly used models to describe um, different regimes of diffusion in polycrystalline materials is this um, is what's called Harrison's regimes or the ABC model for uh, grain boundary diffusion in a polycrystal. Um, the, it's called the ABC model because uh, Harrison is considering three different regimes. There is the A regime at the top where the A stands for all material. The B regime, which stands for a boundary region, and then the C regime, which stands for core only, which is a bit of a stretch alphabetically, as I will explain. Um, but this is uh, a good mnemonic for trying to remember this with the, the ABC designation here. So in this first regime, in this A regime, the diffusion length in the grains is considerably longer than the grain size. Uh, what this means in the A regime is that the diffusion is happening um, you know, on comparable time scales across uh, the crystals themselves and the grain boundaries. Uh, compare that to the B regime, where the diffusion length in the grains is significant but smaller than the grain size. Or in other words, the grain boundary diffusion is a lot faster than diffusion within the grain, but there's still some diffusion within the grain that causes the diffusing matter to uh, diffuse from the grain boundaries, uh, at least partially into the grains themselves. And then the C regime is where the diffusion within the grains is negligible, but um, the only significant diffusion occurs along the grain boundaries themselves. And that's what is noted by the word core here, meaning that the diffusion is just along the grain boundaries themselves. And if we describe this in terms of the, uh, the diffusion length, where this lambda here is a typical interatomic distance, in the A regime, the product of the diffusion coefficient and the time is uh, longer than this atomic distance squared along both uh, the grain boundaries here with this D superscript B and within the crystal itself with this D superscript XL. If we move from the A regime into the B regime, this boundary regime, this is where uh, within the crystal itself, the product of the diffusion coefficient and time is of the same order as the interatomic distance squared. So we have measurable diffusion into the grains, but it's not fast by any means. Uh, on the other hand, grain boundary diffusion continues to be fast. Uh, finally, in this C regime, we retain the very fast uh, diffusion along the grain boundaries, but the diffusion is so slow into the grains that it effectively doesn't matter in this case. Um, and so really these A, B, and C regimes, uh, they depend on um, how fast the diffusion is into the grains. Uh, the diffusion along the grain boundaries is always assumed to be uh, relatively fast. So let's take these regimes one at a time, starting with diffusion in the A regime. 
uh, diffusion in this A regime is macroscopically similar to diffusion in a homogeneous material uh, possessing an effective uh, average diffusivity that we calculated already. Um, so that formula that we had with the, the average diffusivity is just equal to the diffusivity in the crystal times the fraction of atoms that are in the crystal plus the diffusivity along the grain boundary times the fraction of atoms um, that are situated at the grain boundaries. That gives you uh, an effective average diffusivity. And then you can treat this as a homogeneous material using that effective average diffusivity, um, solving the diffusion problem as we already have done in chapter four, uh, just using that average value of the diffusion coefficient. So this A regime is, is actually relatively simple. Uh, because it can be analyzed using the methods that we've already covered earlier in the book. Now, moving on to the B regime, uh, this regime becomes quite a bit more complicated because we have two different regimes of diffusion that occur on two different time scales. You've got uh, the very fast diffusion that occurs along the grain boundaries themselves, and then on a slower time scale, some of that diffusant from the grain boundaries is diffusing into the grains itself. And that is what is represented here by this gray shading, is that you've got some partial penetration of the diffusing matter into the grains itself, but the diffusion along the pathway of the grain boundaries is quite a bit faster. Now, the analysis for this type of diffusion problem is considerably more complex uh, as it involves solving a coupled for coupled diffusion fields on these two different time scales. Um, and basically, uh, and what one could do is solve the diffusion problem first along the grain boundaries themselves. So doing it along this effective um, pathway here represented by the network of grain boundaries, and that is occurring on a faster time scale. Um, this provides the, uh, the initial and boundary conditions for a second diffusion problem that occurs on a slower time scale, uh, which is the diffusion from the grain boundaries into the grains itself. Um, so one simplification that we can make here is to assume that, uh, that the system here is semi-infinite in the y and the z directions and that the boundaries themselves are stationary. So these grain boundaries themselves are assumed to be static on um, the time scale for a diffusion problem. Later on, we'll see that the grain boundaries themselves can also be moving, which adds another complication to the problem and another relevant time scale associated with um, the movement of those grain boundaries. Now, rapid diffusion occurs along the boundaries themselves. So this slab here is assumed to be a very thin grain boundary and there's rapid diffusion along this boundary itself. So along the plane of the blue slab here, um, but then diffusion that goes uh, either uh, forwards or backwards, so into or out of the plane is like leaking of the uh, diffusing material along, in this case, the X direction. And that is solved for um, a, a separate time scale. So you've got fast diffusion, along this blue slab and then slower diffusion that is into or out of the x-axis. Now the third regime is diffusion in the C regime. Um, and here the diffusion within the grains is so slow that we need not consider it in the diffusion problem itself. Um, in the C regime, the only diffusion that matters on the time scale of the experiment is the diffusion along the grain boundaries themselves. Um, so in this regime, diffusion occurs only in the thin grain boundary slabs. Since the number of diffusing atoms within the slabs is very small, experimental measurement of the grain of the boundary concentrations is difficult. Um, so the that is really the, the biggest problem with this um, regime is how do you measure uh, how much diffusion is taking place. And one of the common ways to measure this experimentally is through what's called an accumulation method where you're collecting the diffusing atoms at the opposite boundary and then measuring the total concentration of those atoms that gets collected and then back calculating what the diffusion would be in order to get there. Now, um, this plot shows different regimes of diffusion um, in both stationary and moving grain boundaries. Uh, what we have here is on the y-axis, 
we've got the logarithm of the diffusivity within the crystal times time. So this is a measure of how fast diffusion is happening within the crystals. And then on the x-axis here, we have the logarithm of the velocity of the grain boundaries times time. So this is a measure of how fast the grain boundaries themselves are moving. Now on the left-hand side of this plot, you'll see the A, B, and C regimes. These are the A, B, and C regimes of Harrison's model of uh, diffusion in a polycrystalline material. You can see that these are all on the left-hand side of the plot because they are assuming that the grain boundaries themselves are not moving during the diffusion problem. So this left-hand side of the plot is where the grain boundary velocity is low. This is um, what's called the stationary regime with respect to the grain boundaries. So this left-hand side is the stationary boundaries, and this covers Harrison's A, B, C. Um, model. If you move to the right-hand side here, uh, this is where you've got grain boundary uh, migration that is occurring uh, on the time scale of your diffusion problem. So this would be the regime of migrating boundaries, which of course becomes more complicated because you have um, you know, rates at which the grain boundaries are moving, rates of diffusion along those grain boundaries, and then rates of diffusion from the grain boundaries into the grains themselves. And you know, the geometry of uh, the polycrystalline configuration of the system is changing as a result of those migrating grain boundaries. So the way that we designate this is on the left-hand side, the S here. Um, this S represents stationary grain boundaries. On the right-hand side, the M represents migrating grain boundaries. If the diffusion is happening um, basically on a length scale that's within an isolated grain, then this would be the I here for isolated. This is um, being relatively low uh, on the y-axis here. If we are in this A regime here, this is where the diffusion within the crystal is very fast. So if you're really high up in this y-axis, this is where you've got a high rate of diffusion within the crystal, meaning that the dxl times t is enough to cross multiple grains. So this would be the regime of crossing multiple grains, and that would be designated by and m. Um, now, when we have uh, these different regimes here on the right, uh, on the upper right-hand side, this is where you've got fast diffusion within grains, as well as fast moving grain boundaries. So there is crystal diffusion uh, that is happening ahead of grain boundaries here um, that is above this line. And then if you're below the line, then the diffusion within the crystal is relatively slow compared to the migrating grain boundaries. So there'd be no crystal diffusion ahead of the grain boundaries. So this is just meant to be a relative ranking of how fast the grain boundaries are moving relative to the rate of diffusion within um, the grains themselves. Now, if we have a problem where we have concurrent grain boundary diffusion and migration of grain boundaries, obviously this becomes a very difficult problem to construct mathematically. Um, one of the ways that we can deal with this is with a very simplified model, which is not a great model, but it, it is a starting point. And that is to consider atoms um, diffusing uh, in or diffusing from this uh, thin slab of the grain boundary into um, the grain itself. Where now, this is the same setup that we had in the B regime of Harrison's model, but now this thin slab here that represents the grain boundary, this, this slab itself is moving with some velocity V here. So this slab, let's suppose, is moving along the X direction according to some velocity V. Um, now the slab itself has diffusion that occurs very quickly within the plane of the slab. Um, it is moving on a slower time scale. The slab is moving on a slower time scale and it's also uh, depositing atoms in its wake as a result of diffusion of atoms from the grain boundary into the crystals. Um, one kind of simplified way of solving this is to solve the diffusion equation under a quasi-steady state uh, condition. Um, where we set uh, this diffusion equation equal to zero, which gives us a simple solution of 
um, kind of this Boltzmann um, probability, uh, which is determining the amount of concentrations that get deposited in the wake of the moving green boundary. Um, this is, you know, a very specific solution for a uh, kind of uh, too simplified version of the problem, but it gives you a starting point where you can see um, basically what's happening is that the grain boundary is moving with some velocity here, V, and in the wake of the grain boundary moving, it's depositing this uh, exponential decay of concentration behind it. At the same time, it's it's gaining new concentrations from diffusion along the grain boundaries themselves. Now, for a more realistic case, one would probably need to go to numerical solutions in order to calculate um, all of these different factors that are happening within the material on different timescales. So um, what are exactly the mechanisms of fast boundary diffusion? Um, and this is a, a more complicated question than you would think. Um, so despite the involvement of many diffusive events with different activation energies, the grain boundary diffusion coefficients do follow the Arrhenius law quite accurately, which suggests that diffusion is actually dominated by one type of jump or perhaps a group of jumps with nearby activation energies. Um, there is no unique mechanism for what makes uh, grain boundary diffusion so fast. It can be vacancies or interstitials that can dominate the diffusion flux, depending on the grain boundary structure, the temperature, even the direction of the diffusion. The point is that the grain boundaries are entire planes worth of defects. So um, each of these defects helps to enable faster diffusion. When you have a grain boundary, uh, that entire plane is just full of defects. Now, the anisotropy or the uh, dependence of diffusion on direction um, along the grain boundary can be very significant and can either increase or decrease as um, the temperature changes. Depending on the grain boundary structure, grain boundary diffusion coefficients at a given temperature um, can vary by several orders of magnitude. Hence, the average grain boundary diffusivity in a polycrystal material is not a well-defined physical quantity. Um, if you want to learn more, there's this excellent article here by Suzuki and Mishin, uh, Atomic Me Mechanisms of Grain Boundary Diffusion, Low Versus High Temperatures. Um, it's a bit of, bit of a letdown, though, because we don't really know um, you know, what are the exact mechanisms that cause this? And there's certainly not a universal answer for all types of materials. Um, so that was along grain boundaries. Uh, as we mentioned earlier in the lecture, another type of defect that leads to um, a short circuit diffusion pathway is the dislocation, uh, which is a one dimensional defect in um, a crystal. So uh, dislocation diffusion rates vary with the structure of the dislocation. There are two main types of dislocations. There is uh, the edge dislocation, which is shown here, and the screw dislocation, which is shown here. And in either case, they uh, end up with a line of defects and uh, the diffusion is faster along that line. Um, now, again, there's no universe, universality here, but there is some evidence that's, that edge dislocations here on the left lead to faster diffusion compared to screw dislocations. Um, another uh, way that this can um, enter into the diffusion problem is through the so-called stacking fault ribbons. Uh, with a stacking fault ribbon, the uh, dislocation uh, can dissociate into two partial dislocation lines uh, leading to what you see here is the stacking fault ribbon, where normally if you're stacking planes of atoms on top of each other, let's suppose that this has an ABC, ABC stacking within um, the stacking fault ribbon. Uh, here, there would be uh, basically an error in um, the stacking where this would be AC, AC caused by um, these partial dislocation lines and the diffusion along these partial dislocation lines is faster compared to not having the stacking fault ribbon. So dislocations in close past metals, uh, they do have a tendency to relax to two partial dislocations 
that are connected by the stacking fault ribbon diffusion along dissociated dislocation cores along these partial dislocation lines is slower compared to the non-dissociated core dislocation cores, but still quite a bit faster compared to um, the crystal in the absence of dislocations. So um, now, the, and the other type of defect is diffusion along um, free surfaces. The general macroscopic features of fast diffusion along free surfaces uh, have many similarities to diffusion along grain boundaries because they're both um, planes of defects. Uh, but the free surface here uh, is actually, it provides an ultra fast diffusion pathway because there's no material on the other side. Uh, the atoms on a free surface are just bonded to one side. They are allowed to migrate um, very quickly compared to uh, atoms even along a, uh, a grain boundary, just because of the absence of matter on the other side. And as a result, if you have free surfaces, um, they provide the fastest pathway for uh, diffusion to occur. So to summarize this chapter, uh, crystal imperfections provide pathways for diffusion uh, several orders of magnitude faster than within the crystals themselves. The nature of the diffusion depends on the relative uh, diffusion rates among these various mechanisms. And uh, unfortunately, the detailed atomic mechanisms for um, fast diffusion along these crystalline defects are not well understood. And as far as we know, there's no universal behavior there. Um, so next time, in the next chapter, we're going to deal with motion of dislocations and interfaces. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.